Hi, I'm Eric Dama, pastor at Gospel of Grace Fellowship, and I'm in studio along with Gospel of Grace's theologian and teacher, Bob Duane. We both want to welcome you here to Critical Issues Commentary Radio, where we dig into the great doctrines of the faith revealed verse by verse through the scriptures, and where we teach you how to contend for the faith once for all, handed down to the saints. Well, as always, Bob, it's great to be with you here in studio, and I've been very excited to discuss with you your article that you wrote, done two lessons on this already, but it's the article that you wrote back in the fall of 2013. It's issue 126, and the title of it is, is Dining with the King, Jesus Dines with Sinners, and you have a subtitle, How Banquets in the Bible Reveal Salvation or Judgment. Yep. Now, just one more time, can you explain just the basic overall theme, and you basically did well, in your title. The last two weeks, we went through a bunch of Old Testament incidents. Right. If you didn't hear those, they're going to be there on our website. And here are these feasts that are in Hebrew called Mishta. Right. And each time there's somebody blessed or exalted or honored, yeah. is somebody shamed or judged or killed. It's good for some and not others. Right. And always there's salvation and judgment. Yeah. Or shame and honor. Wow. And usually there's a reversal going on. Yeah. Like in the book of Esther that has the most usages. So we talked about that. Yeah. Amen. And also what happens is God's purposes are going forward. Right. Now, Bob, this idea of reversal, you know, you're not just making this up. This is something that we're going to see explicitly stated by Christ in Luke 13. So we'll be coming to that passage. Yes. As a matter quickly. of fact, when I first started looking at all this, yeah. I was in the middle of preaching through Luke. Right. And Luke really emphasizes reversal. Yeah. And one of the ways Luke shows it is through these feasts. Yeah. Either actual ones or parables about feasts. Right. right. And so eating is an important thing. And we talked about this the last two weeks. They lived in a shame honor society. Yeah. yeah. And that was so important to them. Right. To be honored was everything. It is. To avoid shame was everything. Yeah. And to be shamed was the ultimate disgrace and horrific outcome that you didn't want. Yeah. And it shows up throughout the Bible. Now, let me just tell you about one incident. Here is a little preview. Yeah. Zacchaeus. Yes. Okay. So Zacchaeus would be shamed being a tax collector. Yeah. Right? And one of low status in their society. Right. It didn't matter how much money he had. Because as we've been saying, honor was everything. Money was beside the point. Exactly. <laughs> so you had tax gatherers who had money, but they're shamed. Right. That's right. So they didn't have status. Yeah. So they just had to deal with that. Yeah. So here Jesus comes to his house wow. to dine with him. And Jesus conferred honor by eating with him. Right. Which in our society, if somebody invites themselves over, that's bad. Yeah. Because yeah. it's inconvenient. Right, right. <laughs> but to have this one who everybody wanted to see. Yeah. And this is more than just a children's story about a little guy going up a tree. Yeah, the wee little man was here. It's about <laughs> the shame honor. And it's right. about reversal. That's right. Yeah. Amen. So that's what we're going to learn. Now, today, we want to start by focusing on Isaiah. We'll yeah. see how far we get. Well, but so. there are some prophecies in Isaiah that are predicting shame and honor, salvation and judgment in the context of banquets. Amen. That's right. So, Eric. Yeah. I don't know if you have it open to that, but first of all, I reference Isaiah 5, 12 to 17. Right, right. Yeah, let me turn to that. And this is an interesting passage in that in Isaiah 5, I know there's a song that's sung by Isaiah, and it almost serves as an object lesson where he sings of this love that God has for his vineyard. And of course, the vineyard is Israel, but the way Isaiah does this song is he sings of a beloved and benevolent vine dresser and vineyard planter, and of course, that's Yahweh. And he does all that he can for a vineyard, and the vineyard only produces, literally in the Hebrew, stink fruit. 
Yeah. And of course, the people become irate that we're hearing this. Why would this dumb vineyard not produce anything for this magnificent, benevolent vine dresser? And so they actually become angry, and then, of course, they realize it's themselves. Well, in light of this, you have this allusion to the banquet. And I'm sorry, Bob, was it verse 12? 12 to 17, Isaiah 12 to 5. 17. So here he continues in Isaiah 5, 12 through 17. He says, They have lyre and harp, tambourine and flute, and wine at their feasts, but they do not regard the deeds of Yahweh or see the works of his hands. Therefore, my people, go into exile for lack of knowledge. Their honored men go hungry, and their multitude is parched with thirst. Therefore Sheol has enlarged its appetite and opened its mouth beyond measure, and the nobility of Jerusalem and her multitude will go down, her revelers and he who exalts in her. Man is humbled, and each one is brought low, and the eyes of the haughty are brought low. But the Lord of hosts is exalted in justice, and the holy God shows himself holy in righteousness. Then shall the lambs graze as in their pasture, and no man shall eat among the ruins of the rich. Wow. That's the first use of Mishta yeah. in Isaiah. Right. Okay. Right. And in that case, notice the mention of honor. Yes. What happened to the honored men? Yeah, they're shamed. They're shamed. Right, right. Okay. And God is going to honor himself Amen. by his deeds. Right. And then ultimately the lambs graze. Yeah. And I think we see, you know, later when we get into John and places like that. Right. About God gathering his sheep. Yeah, amen. Exactly right. And yeah, you see, God will not tolerate being shamed. And so he's going to shame his... Yeah, when I wrote a paper, enemies. I may have mentioned this before, but... But when I was in seminary, my senior paper that was necessary for graduation, yeah. I had to take all of the doctrines of systematic theology that are important yeah. and pick an integrating motif and then explain all those doctrines from that perspective. Yeah. And they told us to use something that's not commonly used because they get tired of always reading the same paper. <laughs> okay, you know? right. And I chose honoring God. Amen. And it ended up, I was just rereading it this week because I was looking for what I said about the doctrine of Christ, yeah. which I'm preparing to teach on. Right. But honoring God, see, this honor-shame issue, which is throughout the Bible, Yeah. the most honorable being in the universe is God. Amen. That's right. And he asks at times, where is my honor? Yeah, amen. Okay, so the one thing we have to do no. is to honor God. Amen. And so what I did in that paper, it's actually CIC issue 52 Yeah. that I later published after I graduated. Right. If we don't honor God because of who he is, yeah. then we're shaming him. Exactly right. And the ultimate way of shaming God is making a golden calf. Yeah, amen. And that ties into the, even the third commandment, not taking the Lord's name in vain. It means to dishonor God. Exactly right. And many people have taken that just to mean, well, I don't use the Lord's name as a cuss word. And certainly that would be part of shaming God. Or they think, well, it's just part of oath taking and using Yahweh's name as a kind of an oath marker and then violating the oath. But what you did in a sermon, as you showed rightly, from the data in the scriptures that know the wider issue is God's people taking upon themselves the name of Yahweh, or let's put it in our Christian milieu, we take upon ourselves the name Christian, yet we live in a way that's no different than the pagan Let world, and we shame God. the name of the Lord, depart yeah. from iniquity. Exactly. So, if you're interested in that one, I talk about that in one of my messages on the Ten Commandments. Yeah. It's on our CIC YouTube channel. That's right. So you can go look there and find that one. Now, this Isaiah 5 that you quoted, it uses the word Mishta in there. Yeah. So there's a reversal. There's shame. Yeah. And God is the one who should be honored. Right. Exactly. Isn't that the That's key? exactly right. And then I think you rightly point out in your article that this foreshadows then this picture of a reversal 
in which God will be honored, but his people will be honored one day because he's going to bring a faithfulness that they couldn't bring about. And he's going to do that work. And we find that in, in Isaiah chapter 25. Yeah, that's where we're going to go. So the next use of Mishta in Isaiah is in Isaiah chapter 25, 6 through 9. Yeah, now Bob, what's interesting about this section is it's within a whole section called the universal kingdom where there's two major points that Isaiah is driving at. It's all the way from Isaiah 13 all the way to Isaiah 27. And the focus there is the Davidic kingship of the future Messiah, but also the future reign from Zion. And what's very interesting is in this particular section that we find the reference to the Mishta in Isaiah 25, there's a contrast between two cities, the cities of ruin, or the, I should say the city singular of ruin. Sometimes it's called the city of chaos. And we see that, for example, in uh, Isaiah 24.10. Well, that's contrasted with Mount Zion. Mm-hmm. It's going to be the city of God's rule. Well, when you follow that all the way through the scriptures, it ends up leading to, in the book of Revelation, Babylon is the city of chaos. And that's going to be thrown down. It really represents man's arrogance, his attempting to make a name for himself while he's shaming God. So that's like all the way back to Babel. Exactly, but what did God do? He turns the table and does the reverse. So they were going to create their own honor. Yeah, exactly. And and that's exactly what was going on in Isaiah 5. That's right. Because the wealthy are throwing a banquet for themselves to honor themselves. Right. It's shocking. Yeah. That's not valid. No, it's not valid. That's right. So we need to humble ourselves yeah. and pray that God would show honor to his own name by saving us. Yeah. Amen. Well said. And what's so interesting, Bob, when you wrote this, I think you're exactly right in your take on the whole idea of reversal. In fact, what's interesting is there's two songs that bracket this Mishta. One is a song of the ruined city, the, the city of chaos in Isaiah 25, 1 through 5, where the people of God sing about the destruction of their enemies and the fact that the city of chaos, Babylon's thrown down. Well, then you have the Mishta, this eschatological banquet. And then right after that, there's another song, and it's the exaltation of the strong city and how God is going to reign from that. So the Mishta is bracketed by song. One is about the downfall of the enemies of God, their shame. Yeah. And the other one is about the exaltation of God and his people. And then you have the Mishta in between, and it, it just ties in real nicely. So the Mishta thing. often is related to song and wine. Yeah. Amen. Okay. And reveling. Yes. You were saying their wine was actually stink fruit. Yeah, exactly. That's bad. That's bad, yeah. That's yeah. not good. Yeah, that's all they produced because they had, in fact, violated their covenant obligations and sinned against Yahweh. You know, I pointed out in my article that these Mishta feasts in the Old Testament are all really about the gospel. Amen. Because that's what they're pointing forward to. Well said. That God is bringing the gospel and he Mm -hmm. preaches the gospel to the poor. Yeah. Wow. And the ones that thought they had everything or brought low. Right. So there's always this reversal going on. It is. It's really there, isn't it? Eric, could you read then this next passage in Isaiah where Mishta is found, and that's in Isaiah 25, 6 through 9. Certainly. Here's Isaiah 25, 6 through 9. The ESV says, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be on that day, Behold, this is our God, We have waited for him that he might save us. This is Yahweh. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Wow. Wow. That's exciting. So it is about salvation. Yeah. Amen. So salvation is portrayed as a lavish banquet. Yeah. And he's swallowing up 
of veil or a covering. Right. It says he will swallow up the covering, which is over all people, even the veil stretch over all nations. Yeah. So now this goes beyond Israel. Yes. To all nations. Right. Now remember that in the Old Testament, back in the Genesis, at Babel, they were trying to honor themselves. Yeah. And God confused their languages and they were scattered. Right. And then there's this table of nations. Yep. And God draws out the boundaries of the nations, That's according right. to the Bible. Yeah, right? Right. And so because of man's desire to honor himself, yeah. which you were talking about, God scattered them and put them under the sons of God. Yes. Deuteronomy yeah. 32, right? Right. Amen. Okay. So now we have a prophecy about this covering or veil yeah. that at some point is going to be taken away. Right. And there's going to be eschatological salvation. Yeah. Amen. So... This is really important, and I pointed out in my article that this is really the background for a lot of the banquet scenes in the Gospel of Luke. I think you're exactly right, and what's interesting is when it talks about this veil being removed at this banquet and what happens in the day that the Lord reigns from his holy mountain, which is Zion. And by the way, this all ties back to Isaiah 2 when he makes this promise that the, the swords will be beat into plowshares and the spears into pruning hooks, etc., well, what's interesting is this veil that's going to be removed. We know that it has to do with death because the very next verse, he says, he will swallow up death forever. And I think you make a good point, Bob, that I don't think we should limit this to either, well, the, just the first advent or just the second advent, but it really has to do with both in that death oftentimes in the scriptures has to do both spiritual death that is being separated from God because of sin and physical death are on the table here. And the idea then is that because people are going to have the veil removed, as we see in the idea of regeneration promised by the new covenant, people are able to be able to come to faith in the Messiah where they can find forgiveness of sins. And then they're spared from physical death in the resurrection and they have a partaking in the Lord's kingdom. So I think both are on the table. So we don't have to choose either or? I think you're right. Well, that's how I interpret it. Yeah. Because... If you limit it to one or the other, you're losing something. Yeah, exactly. For one thing, something did happen when Messiah came. Yeah. That did remove, in some sense, this veil. Right. Because now special revelation comes to the Gentiles. Exactly. See, before, all they had was general revelation. Exactly. And they didn't have the oracles of God, as it says. Right. Yeah, and the problem with general revelation that we learn in Romans 1 is that it's only good enough to hang you, as the old saying goes. It's not good enough to see you. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, this is God wonderful. brings salvation to Gentiles. Right. It was prophesied in the Old Testament. Yeah. But the Jews in their rabbinical teachings really didn't notice that so much, did they? Right, right. It's they just saw the, the Gentiles as the shameful yeah. goyim and... Yeah. They were unclean. That's right. And you know what's interesting is that's a theme that we see all the way back to Genesis 12, 3, that even God's dealings with Abraham was going to be a blessing to all the nations, not just for Israel. And that follows right after Babel. You have God bringing a new humanity, a new nation that will bring honor to him through Abraham. And through Abraham obviously comes Messiah, but Messiah's work is for not just Israel, but the Gentiles as well. Right. Yeah. So he comes as the promised one to Israel, but he also incorporates salvation to the Gentiles. Yeah. He meant, you so know, you see a, that in Acts, like Acts 1-8. Yeah. To be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, then Samaria, Amen. then to the ends of the earth. Amen. That's a major theme, too, in the book of Isaiah. This is so prevalent in Luke. Yeah. And actually, Luke Acts, it's amazing. I've been teaching this for so long, and I'm so blessed and so honored to yeah. even share in this yeah. or to be able to see it that's right. and to rejoice in it so god is reversing things exactly and the shameful ones are finding salvation wow and the ones who are honoring themselves in their own mind yes and are seeking honor right in other words the Hamans we talked about in exactly. a previous one of these radio shows 
they're cast down. Yeah, the Mordecais are lifted up. The Mordecais are lifted up. Yeah. And that's exactly what happens when Messiah comes. That's right. So what I said in this article is that I believe this is a composite pr prophecy. Right, right. So the removal of the veil in the sense that specific revelation yeah. goes to the Gentiles yeah. as well as the Jews. Right. And salvation goes to the Gentiles. Yes. As well as the Jews under the new covenant yeah. when Messiah comes. There's still yet to be fulfilled the final eschatological banquet. Amen. So that lavish banquet for all nations is still foreshadowed in Luke right. in some of these parables yeah. and stories about banquets. Right. And we'll look at that as we go through this teaching. Yes. But the veil's removed in the sense that the nations now receive the gospel. Now I notice yeah. here that I cited, well, first of all, I used Isaiah 61, 1 through 3 to illustrate what a composite prophecy looks like. Yes, I think it's very smart. Okay, so in Luke 4, 18, Jesus quotes Isaiah 61. Yeah. He cites it to show that salvation comes through him, the anointed one, yeah. and his work. Right. But there's a, also a part of that that says, and the day of the vengeance of our God, Jesus did not cite that part. Yeah, he leaves that deliberately. Because out. it doesn't happen until later. Exactly. So Isaiah 61, 1 through 3, yeah. is about Messianic salvation. Yeah. It's a composite prophecy, part of which is fulfilled in the first advent, and the other part fulfilled in the second advent. Well said, Bob. And so if we can understand that that kind of prophecy exists, yeah. and we know it does because Jesus used the Bible that way. Yeah. You know, we see the same thing in John 19, I believe, when the writer John, inspired by the Spirit, cites from Zechariah 12.10, says they'll look upon him whom they'd pierced. Oh, yeah. Well, he really leaves off the rest of it, and they'll mourn for him as the one mourns for It doesn't happen until later. Exactly. The mourning for Messiah when the repentance... The piercing makes. already happened. Exactly. Yep. So we see this composite idea all over the place. Yes. Yeah, so, so, dear listeners, it's important to understand. Yeah. We want everybody to really understand the Bible. Exactly. This is so powerful. It is. See, our minds are renewed by the Word of God. Yeah. We start thinking biblically... We start believing biblically, and by God's grace, through means of grace, we start acting biblically. Amen. What's Amen. practical? Some people will say, oh, you seminary type, you like to learn all this stuff. It's very practical. Yeah. It's, it's practical about how we treat people. It is, yes. And James says that. Right. Oh, some rich guy comes into your church and you say, here, sit in this good place. Right, yeah. Well, people have trouble even understanding James, because we don't have necessarily an honor-shame world that's quite as intense as theirs was. Exactly. So everybody comes in, finds a seat, and we have church. Right, that's right. So we don't have to necessarily designate the place of honor here or there. Yeah, yeah. Although, yeah. you know, that may happen. I've seen preachers on TV sitting on gold thrones. Yeah. <laughs> I would have to say they sat themselves on the place of honor. Yeah, that's very true. Okay, that's bad. If they understood this, they wouldn't do that. Right. Yeah. That makes it practical. That's right. And we can see that they're doing what they shouldn't want to do Exactly. if you understood this Mishta idea. That's right. And you know, the other practical element of this, Bob, is when you lay out this article, it shows the profundity of Scripture. And when you show the profundity of Scripture, what you demonstrated are, is that these things are true. And in the dark days of life, when people have their doubts, even John the Baptist had the doubt, are you the one or should we look for another? He's literally asking, are you the coming one, the Messiah? Well, in the dark days of life, it's, it's nice to be able to say, you know what, I've looked at the evidence. I know that these promises I are true. I can always trust the promises of God. Amen. That's right. So one of the points here, as we understand his veil... I cite in Acts 14 something Paul preached. Yeah, I love that. And he said this, And in the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways. Yeah. And yet he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good and gave you rains from heaven 
and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness, Acts 14, 16, and 17. Yeah. So here's some categories yeah. that we can see from Paul's sermon in Asia Minor. Yeah. That he permitted the nations to go their ways, but what they had was general revelation and common grace we use as a theological category. That's right. And what is that all about? Well, the rains that cause the garden to grow, bear fruit, yeah. don't discriminate between the Christian and the non-Christian or yeah. the Jew and the Gentile. The rain falls on They're the for just everyone. and the unjust. Yeah, so know. people can see the glory of God in creation. Exactly. And therefore they should know to honor him. Yeah, amen. But they don't, according to Romans 1. Right, right. And yeah. so now, Paul is going to preach Christ to them. Yes. And that's where the veil is removed, because it says that in 2 Corinthians. Exactly. When we come to the Lord, the veil's removed. Yeah, amen. Here it's talking about the veil that Moses had to hide his glory. Yes. But if anybody comes to the Lord, the veil is removed. And yeah. now, rather than dimly seeing glory... Right, we see it. We see the true glory of God in its greatest manifestation in messianic salvation. Amen. Saint Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this age has blinded the unbelieving, the unregenerate, so they do not see the glorious gospel. And you're right, Bob. I think one of the promises here in Isaiah 25 is that that will be removed. So spiritual death is removed. Physical death will, will be removed for the people of God. And in the eschatological kingdom, you're going to have this glorious banquet. Now, what's very interesting is you cite in the book of Luke and you show different mishtas and banquets that occur. And what's so shocking to me is when I saw all the data that you laid out, it's as if it's one of the major themes that Luke has. And it's almost as if he's building right off of Isaiah. Did I know. I think there's that an allusion Luke? to it yeah, yeah. many times about the banquet. Right. So God is going to prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples. Exactly. Bring right, right And so right Jesus down. came and announced the gospel of salvation. Wow. And predicted that it was going to go to all peoples. And he gave previews of salvation by saving unexpected people and even doing things like in Luke 8. If you look at Luke Acts, there's previews. He goes to the place of the Gadarenes hmm. and finds the most horrible situation right and he heals this man yeah. delivers him from satan heals him and left him there although he wanted to follow jesus to be a witness right and so we're going to see so many of these things and i don't know how any christian can study luke acts and light of these banquets in the old testament and not get excited about salvation right. and about spreading the gospel because Dear listeners, who do we know that won't respond to the invita invitation to the banquet? Yes. Now, the gospel is more than an invitation. Right. It's a command to repent. That's right. I'm not watering it down. Right. But the people who think like Haman, yes. they uh, get it all wrong. Yeah, amen. Okay. Oh, I'm so great. Of course, I'll be honored. Right, right. I don't need to change. I don't need to repent. Just Sunday, I preached about the guy in Luke 18 that said, God be merciful to me, the sinner. The sinner, right. And the other guy was saying, well, I'm glad I'm not like everybody. Uh, yeah. So there's the reversal. Right, right. The ones that don't see any hope have no status. Yeah. And hear the gospel telling them they're lost, wretched sinners. Right. And saving grace pierces hearts. Amen. That's and right. And people change and they repent. I got an email from a fellow from our church I thought was very interesting. I don't know if you were copied, but I was just preaching about God be merciful to me, the sinner. Yeah. And here's the guy's reading. I thought it was great. Yeah. There's two things those two agreed on. Yeah. And that was that the tax gatherer was the sinner. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that something? Isn't yes, that a good reading? That's a good reading. That's very astute. That's right. Yeah, the, the tax gatherer knew he was the sinner. Right. 
And the Pharisee <laughs> knew the tax gatherer was the sinner. That's well, what he. But the Pharisee didn't know was he was the sinner too, but he wouldn't believe it. Bob, it's a beautiful point. And you know what's so interesting about that is that ties again into Christ's ministry in Isaiah 61 because he was anointed by the Spirit to preach good news to the poor. And I think the poor there isn't just financially poor, but it's the poor in spirit, I think is what it says. The shamed ones. The shamed ones, exactly. Whoever's the shameful. Right. And those who realize that truth be told, they have nothing going for themselves. We're the shameful. Exactly. Like Mephibosheth. Yeah, well, it always goes back to Mephibosheth. Yeah, who might have been a dead dog. Yeah, I'm a dead dog. I'm the shameful one from nowhere. I got nothing going for me. That's right. That's right. And Paul labors that point in 1 Corinthians. He says, not many of you were high and mighty in the world's eyes, but yet God called you. And that's the wonderful news. Well, Well, dear listeners, maybe today this is sinking in. Yeah. And you're understanding, I haven't honored God. I am the shameful one. And there's no way I have the right garments to attend his banquet. Right. Only God could ever do that for me. Yeah. Today is the day to turn to Christ. Amen. To repent and believe the gospel. Right. Because the only garments that are suitable for the Messianic banquet are the ones he provides for us. Wow. That's right. Well, Bob, thank you. And I look forward to delving into more of these. Yeah, next, next time. time we'll start with some of the First Advent eschatological banquets. Sounds wonderful. We're out of time for this edition of Critical Issues Commentary Radio. We want to remind all of you out there that you can access this program at our website at cicministry.org. Bob, it's a real pleasure discussing these things, and it's so fun to look into the deep things of Scripture with you. I look forward to doing it next week. I love studying the Bible. Amen. Well, we both want to remind all of you out there to stand firm in one spirit with one mind and strive together for the faith of the gospel.